ever wake up feeling like there's something missing from your life? Maybe a series of unfortunate events have taken place. Like finding out worn winches suck while trying to do a shot that you think is funny. But those feelings of doom and disappointment end today. Because I'm building a V10 Nissan Patrol. That's right, this is a V10 Nissan Patrol, and it starts, runs, drives, and stops. Even though everyone said it couldn't be done. But you already know that, so here's what's happening in this episode. Yes, handbrakes, for those of you who can't read. Why do I need to make a handbrake? Nissan Patrols come with one. Here's why. Your typical Nissan Patrol has a handbrake mounted to the back of the transfer case. That's about here. And this engine and gearbox combination comes from a Volkswagen Touareg. And the V10 twin turbos have a handbrake in here. So, to my dismay, seeing as I've removed the gearbox from the Nissan, I've removed all the provisions to have the Nissan handbrake in place. And seeing as I'm using the diffs from the Nissan, I no longer have the provisions to put the Volkswagen Touareg handbrake in place. So essentially, I have nothing to use as a handbrake. Which is why I'm making my own. But first, dangly bits. Namely these ones. And this one. And no, this is not a simple zip tie job. I have to make these little dangly things do what the dangly things are supposed to do. And I am going to start with the low hanging fruit. Wheel speed sensors. Now this is a wheel speed sensor from the Volkswagen Touareg. And this is a passive system. You can tell because it has two pins. And how this works is that this part is completely non-magnetic. And you hold it up close to a wheel that spins around that has various magnets on it and these are positioned north and south in an alternating arrangement. Now if you were to get an oscilloscope on this, it would look something like this. And what you can notice is the magnetic field goes from a theoretical 1 to a theoretical minus 1, meaning that it passes the zero point. This is important. Because when you compare them to the ABS sensors that are in the patrol diffs, they are the same but different. Same, same. Never mind. But depart. Now while these are also a two pin, they have a different kind of setup. On those, the sensor itself is magnetic, and the wheel that sends the signal is just made out of plain steel. It's toothed, and looks a little bit like this. Now if we go back to the oscilloscope graph, the first one, for reference, looks like this. The new one looks like this. And this goes between a hypothetical one and a zero. Notice that it doesn't go below zero, because it doesn't touch on a negative polarity. And this is where trial and error comes in, because I'm just going to put it all together and hope that it works. Because if the ECU is programmed to look for a signal between 1 and minus 1, and it's receiving one between 1 and 0, then it's going to have problems. Now obviously if I plug it in and it just works, that's bloody marvellous. But if it doesn't, there's a chance I might have to make a little Arduino signal interceptor to take the signal from the patrol sensors and turn them into the Torex sensors. The Torex sensors output, that is. I suck at explaining things. Now the first obstacle I encountered was finding the plugs for this, because if I want to convert this from this sensor into the patrol sensor, it's going to be best if I use these plugs. And I've searched for many hours to try and find out what these are. You can find it almost but not quite right, and then it dawned on me. It's almost like they planned this. Now with this wonderful knowledge, here's the other end on the Nissan Patrol side. And this is where the sensor plugs in. All I essentially have to do is take that piece that I just chopped off the Toreg wiring and, thanks light, and attach it to this nice little one that I bought off AliExpress, which is very easy to find. Take note, Volkswagen. 
And as if by magic, all the weird dangly bits have gone, and the wiring is done. Most of the stuff done with it has been rooting the wires, so they're not touching anything hot or getting in the way of anything moving. But most of it, I'd say, is looking pretty factory. Why didn't I do a montage of this? Because nobody gives a shit about someone wiring up eight wires. You might, however, notice one more dangly bit. And no, it's not a horse penis. Toasty! What do you mean not everybody has a penis? And we're finally onto that part of the build where I'm talking about making a transmission break. Or a tranny break. You cut that out now, or you'll go home in an ambulance. And everything I'm gonna build revolves around this. A strange little mechanical caliper. As you can see, in red. These don't typically come in red, and neither should you. And all it is is a simple lever mechanism. You pull the lever, the brake pad moves. But this is absolute garbage and I didn't know this before buying it. Because there's no spring to actually retract the pad itself. This is just kind of rattling around in there. So one of two things will happen. I'll end up making a brake pad retainer like on every other car. Or I'm going to throw this in the bin and just buy something that actually has a proper mechanism. But for now, I'm using this. Now this is obviously the business end of my transfer case. And this is the bit that my drive shaft attaches to. And if I can make a brake disc to mount on here behind the drive shaft, I can then attach this brake caliper here to clamp onto that brake disc, and then use that sway bar disconnect cable we talked about in the last episode to operate it. That means we need a bracket. Many brackets. Now I've already taken all my measurements. That was for dramatic effect. So let's get to the cutting out stuff and seeing if it fits. As you can see, fits marvelously. I've given it a bit of paint, but as you can see, something's missing. And that missing something is this half of the brake caliper. And I'm gonna talk about ratios. Now my plan is to have this caliper exert about 250 kilograms of force onto that brake disc. That number has come from this. I pulled it out of my ass. But chances are it's gonna be plenty to stop this car. Now that may well be an excessive amount of force because I found it on the internet based on wheel mounted parking brakes. And seeing as this is a transmission mounted parking brake, I get the added benefit of the equivalent of 3.9 times the added force from this end. That's diff reduction. Now with this in mind, the testing standard according to ADR3 is actually pretty slack. Meaning you don't really have to have a good handbrake to pass the test. You just have to have it hold the car on a certain level of incline, both up and down. But if I can do mad skids, better. Now, going back to ratios. This lever has a 40 millimeter throw. And if I adjust this pad so it's exactly flush with the surface, and then fully engage the lever, this comes up by about four millimeters. So, 40 millimeters of throw, resulting in four millimeters of movement. That means there's a ratio of 10 to one. What this also means is that if I want to achieve a clamping force of 250 kilos, I only need to pull that little lever by 25 kilos to fully engage the handbrake. That seems pretty reasonable to me. So there it is looking fancy. You might be thinking to yourselves, why has he put black paint on that disc? Why doesn't it have any holes drilled in it? Because that's what brake discs have. 
Well, it's a parking brake, not a racing brake disc. So there's no need whatsoever to have any vents or drilled holes or any of that nonsense. Instead, I want as much surface area as possible, so this caliper has the best clamping force possible. Anyway, mechanically, this is all done. I fiddle around with this lever and my brake does do hickey things. The only annoyance is this cable. It's about three inches too short to fit without needing an extension, and extending this cable by about three inches would be so much easier if it was about two or three feet shorter, because then I could mount all my gubbins in the side of the chassis there and then come off that. But instead, I have to figure something out with this, because as you can see, it'll attach up there nicely, but this is where the pressure needs to be applied. But that's a job for future me. I have no idea how long this episode's gonna be. Maybe it's a short one, but here's some filler content. Interior is coming along quite nicely. We've got carpet. I've still got to make one battery tray for this one at the back. This is the factory Toreg one. I'm going to use that because it works quite nicely. And I'm not quite sure about what I'm supposed to do in here. About a third of the space is taken up by the batteries anyway. So rather than making a lumpy section go down to nothing and then having an awkward sized space, I'm thinking I could make a little platform to go all the way across and maybe have a drawer or two here. But I'll figure that out another time. We've got rear seats with factory 12 volt power sockets. Zoom in for special effect. And the side that you sit in is almost done. Check this phenomenal thing out. The only GQ with a working clock. And lastly, I wonder what these things are. Okay.